Hello, I am Dr. Steve Johnson, and welcome to REBT Works, where we discuss anything and everything having to do with Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, or REBT. Today, I want to talk about how we can help clients with anxiety who are inferring that in the environment there is some kind of overwhelming threat. If we go back to REBT and how we conceptualize an emotion such as anxiety, we always look at three things in the conceptualization. One, identify the inference that is related to that emotion. Two, identify the irrational or unhelpful beliefs causing that emotion. And then thirdly, identify the behavioral or action potential. Today, I will be focusing on that first point of identifying the inference and then what do we do with that inference that is associated with anxiety. Typically, uh, people, when they think about REBT, think that we're going to do some cognitive restructuring specifically on the beliefs. And that is tremendously important. And there are numerous places where we discuss that. I think we discuss less what we do with an inference that is associated with a, um, a dysfunctional emotion. So today, I want to look at the inference of threat that is typical for anxiety and what we can do to help clients address it realistically and helpfully. What is, what, you know, what are some examples of the kinds of inferences of threat that are made in, uh, in an individual with anxiety? One might be that there's a threat to self-esteem, they're going to fail at something, they're going to be disapproved or rejected, or that there is a, a threat to something other than self-esteem, like I'm going to lose my control or self-control. I'm going to be uncertain about whether the threat will occur or not, or I'm going to experience discomfort, etc. So those are typical kinds of threats that we see with individuals with anxiety. First thing we need to do is help clients identify very specifically what the threat is that they are inferring. And Wendy Dryden came up with a technique that he calls the magic question, which is applied to a number of examples that helps us to identify a theme in that individual who has anxiety. There are three steps to this. First is to have the client focus on a situation in which she or he experiences anxiety. And secondly, identify, without changing the situation at all, identify an aspect or ingredient that would be eliminated or that would significantly reduce the anxiety, and then realize that the opposite of that ingredient is what they are most anxious about. Let's just take an example. Let's say that the client comes in and he or she is really anxious about getting up and giving a lecture in front of a group of colleagues. We've got that. We know what that situation is now. And then we ask them to identify an ingredient that would eliminate or reduce the anxiety, but without changing the situation in any way. And so the individual might say, well, I would not be thinking that the people are judging me. So now we know that what the individual is inferring is having thoughts that people are judging uh, her. So that helps us identify specifically what we're looking at. Let's move on to understand the components of what, again, what Wendy Dryden would call a, an anxiety response. And there, there would be three areas, emotional, behavioral, and kind of cognitive or thinking components of the anxiety response. Emotional would be that the emotional goal is to become concerned rather than anxious. Behavioral, and I'll get into this a little bit more later, is to take action that is based on uh, concern rather than the anxiety. 
and then thinking would would uh, be those cognitions that are associated with concern rather than anxiety. Inferences might be part of those uh, thinking, and what we would hope there would be that we would change the inferences so that they are realistically about the probability of the threat rather than assuming that the threat will actually occur in a very rigid way. Two, that they would view that threat realistically. And then thirdly, realistically assess the their ability to actually deal with that threat should it actually be real. Now, typically in REBT at this point, we would then identify, challenge, and replace the anxiety-producing beliefs. But today, I want to focus in on the inferences. It's not that we would not look at those beliefs, but you can get that in uh, so many other places. Today, as I said, I want to focus on looking at the inferences. There are several things that we can do, and one is to examine or help the client examine the accuracy of the threat actually occurring. So we could pose questions like, how likely is it that this will happen? To would a group of rational, objective individuals agree with your assessment of a threat? Third, did you view the threat realistically? If not, how could it, uh, how could you view it more realistically? And fourth, if I ask a rational, objective person about how they would think uh, you should view it, what might they say? And then lastly, if, I ha if you had a friend who was holding the same inference about the threat, if you had a friend who was holding the same inference about the threat, what would you say to that individual? So that might be ways that we can help them uh, examine the accuracy of the threat. Another and additional approach to deal with the inference about the activating event or critical activating event that is or you know will be a threat is one to keep in mind that we have looked at what the thoughts would be if we were concerned rather than anxious, but we could also address the exaggeration of the threat and the over focusing on the projected enormity. Of the, of the threat. Evolutionarily, thoughts develop to assess threat for our survival. Our brain is a pattern-seeking or pattern-recognizing or pattern-appraising organ that it is designed more for our survival than our happiness. Therefore, we are much more likely to interpret perceived patterns in the environment where there is no threat than perceiving safety when there is a threat. If we perceive threat where there is no threat, then we experience anxiety, you know, and physiological arousal, and we experience it needlessly, but we're still alive. However, if we perceive safety when there is a threat, then we could die or suffer tremendous pain. This is valuable in terms of increasing our possibility of survival. However, it isn't helpful for reducing anxiety when there is no real threat. Today, society is very complex and necessitates social cooperation, but anxiety about aspects of that social cooperation might get in the way of this actually helping us, especially when we infer threat when there is no real threat of life or a threat to life or um, great pain. For example, in our complex culture, we often perceive threat uh, about something that isn't really a threat. For example, uh, we may have anxiety about how others perceive us or anxiety about making a mistake in front of people, which is not a threat to life or pain or any of that, or anxiety about getting a low grade on an exam, anxiety about getting a disease when we've taken every potential precaution uh, that we can, or anxiety that someone might criticize us or 
anxiety about asking someone out a date, all kinds of things that we infer there's a threat where there may not actually be a threat. So how can we address this issue of having an anxiety-related inference of threat that includes the idea that the threat is just an overwhelming threat, fully that the situation is fully and completely a threat. One thing that we can do that would be a corrective is to help the client complexify and make more realistic the degree of threat and non-threat. Instead of the client inferring the situation as overwhelming threat, we could work with the client to help them view it as a combination of threat and opportunity, which is the more likely scenario on most things in life. Sometimes there is an overwhelming threat. If someone is holding a gun at you and has said they're, they're going to kill you, that may be an overwhelming threat. But most life situations are not like that. Let me give an example. It, let's say I'm feeling kind of lonely and I realize that it might be a good idea to take a risk and reach out to make a friend, maybe invite them out for a coffee or whatever. However, I'm anxious about it and my anxiety related inference is that if I ask someone to go out for coffee, they will reject me. So there's a threat to my self-esteem. The problem is that the individual is focusing exclusively or primarily on the threat, not opportunity. Two, that they're magnifying their inability to deal with the potential rejection. And thirdly, they're failing to consider the likelihood of the potential opportunity. A more realistic inference might be, if I ask the person out for a coffee, the person might say no, that is possible, but there's also the possibility that they might say yes. So that's a much more balanced one rather than the inferring in kind of a black-white sense and tending to infer the negative outcome. Of course, we would deal with the irrational beliefs associated with the, with the person receiving a no as on, uh, based on the invitation, but we could also help the individual form the new threat opportunity inference and combine that with a behavioral assignment to act upon the opportunity, and then to practice doing that repeatedly. So you see, we complexify the overwhelming threat inference and, and how, help them develop a threat plus opportunity inference and combine that with that behavioral assignment to have them act into the opportunity rather than engage in the avoidance, which is typically, typically going to be the um, the result of inferring um, threat. Dryden says that one thing we could do, and I think it is important, is to help the anxious person develop a more realistic view of the world rather than see it as uh, an environment composed only of overwhelming threat that actually then sets the stage for us to experience needless and at times debilitating anxiety. I think better inferences that we can help the client with is to, is to move away from the world as an overwhelming threat and that I am utterly unable to deal with it. Instead of have that, having that inference that the world is this overwhelming threat and I am utterly incapable of dealing with it, is to have inferences such as, you know, the world does contain threats, but it also contains opportunities as well. And there is also threat and safety in the world. It's not all a threat. Another one might be, I may not be fully in control over what happens in the world, but that doesn't mean that I have absolutely no control. There are things that I can control. And of course, one of those is to control the way that I think about it, but also I can do things that increase the likelihood of safety. Another one is that an inference that people are either trustworthy or not trustworthy, but like most things, people are not either trustworthy or not trustworthy 
but more, like most things in world, they're on a continuum, and this would be a continuum of uh, trustworthiness. Another inference might be, or worldview, in fact, is even if something is a threat, I might find opportunities that could lead to enjoyment and happiness even in the face of threat. And then lastly, for example, I might not be perfect, and I'm probably not perfect, and let's just admit I'm not perfect in assessing threat, but I can work on looking for signs of safety and opportunity as well as threat in the environment, so have a much more balanced look of the world. REBT can help our clients and us actually to make inferences about the self, others, life, and the world that are far more rational, far more realistic, more balanced, and end up being more optimistic so that we navigate better through life with less dysfunctional emotions and behaviors. Thank you so much. I hope you found this helpful and that you will go out there and with clients begin to look at their inferences as well as beliefs. Thank you so much and have a great day.